happen if we continue the way we are operating is until a vaccine is manufactured, distributed, and injected, we will go through a depression era period in the country, and millions of people will die around the globe, and as many as a million Americans are going to die. Hell is coming. YouTube, what is up? It is your boy Kobe Presents back with another video. Hope you guys are doing well. Hope you guys are in good spirits wherever you're watching this. Today's video is going to be a doozy. We're focusing on the stock market crash of 2020, a story that I don't think is told too many times because now we're sitting at all time highs. But I'm telling you at the time, it was one of the craziest things that we've ever seen. If you guys enjoy the video, please make sure to drop a like, subscribe if you're new. We're just starting out here, but we're going to be making a ton of great investing content down the road. And with that said, let's hop right into the video. Future Kobe, let's take it away. What a year 2019 was. In many ways, it might as well be written on its gravestone, the year we took for granted. People were making money, people were getting laid, and people were having fun. Of course, all that stuff happened in 2020 as well, but perhaps not at the same level. Yet at the beginning of the year, we really had no idea just exactly what 2020 had in store for us. Take the stock market for example. After a mini scare in December 2018 that threatened the nearly decade plus bull market, 2019 roared back with higher performance. The Dow rallied 22%, the S&P 500 soared 28.9%, and the Nasdaq rocketed 35.6%. In fact, major stock indices did so well that it left many hedge fund managers in the position of having awkward conversations with wealthy clients as to why they couldn't produce the same results, yet charged a laughable 2% fee and 20% profits. We'll get back to these guys later on. All that aside, the question in January 2020 was how much longer this rally could go on and when it would be time to take profits before major correction was coming. Well, a few people might have had an inkling and it happened to be our public servants. Because on Friday, January 24th, the Senate Health Committee in conjunction with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee held an all-senator briefing on a little-known outbreak in Wuhan, China known as the coronavirus. Keep in mind at this point the first confirmed case in the United States was on January 21st or three days prior and a week before that, the world World Health Organization tweeted out their now infamous tweet informing the public that there was no clear evidence of human to human transmission of the virus. Pretty brutal. While we're not sure what Dr. Fauci and other top administration officials told the Senate that Friday afternoon, my guess is the level of concern expressed might have been a tad more ominous than what Congress shared with the public. And oh well, what do you know? Reports surfaced that some United States senators conveniently cashed out of the market shortly after the hearing. I wonder what they knew. Anyways, at that time, Mr. Market laughed off the threat of coronavirus and continued its pace towards all-time highs going into February 2020. Even when reports came out that China's growing economy was actually going to contract, investors across the world really didn't blink an eye. Through the third week of February, the market was actually still positive for the year. It wasn't until the final week of Feb, where the growing spread across the world made US markets go, wait a second, maybe this isn't just a China thing. Coincidentally, the Oracle of Omaha himself, Mr. Warren Buffett, had one of his rare exclusive CNBC interviews on the first day of a week-long bloodbath. He said that there's a lot of wretched excess out there and that there's a lot of trouble coming as a result. Do you agree with that? There's always trouble coming. Yeah, there was trouble coming in 1942 when I bought that first stock, all kinds of trouble. Certainly trouble in 2008 when I wrote an article for the New York Times, I said trouble is coming, but I said buy stocks. <laughs> <laughs> would you repeat that this time? If trouble's coming, would you still say buy stocks right now? I would say buy stocks if you get it up for your money. Staying on brand with his eternal message of buying at all times, Buffett reminded us on the resiliency of America and he remained confident in the long-term health of the stock market. But even the market mover himself couldn't change the tide. Hell, Super Saiyan Goku couldn't move this market. This baby was going down. No wrong baby. Not that one either. There you go. Oh, bro.
Nonetheless, by the end of the week of February 28th, with grim reports all across the world about COVID's potency, both the S&P 500 and Dow decreased over 10% in one week's time, not only securing its spot as the worst week since the 2008 financial crisis, but also became the fastest correction from all-time highs in market history. To put it in perspective, $3.4 trillion of the S&P 500's market capitalization was wiped out like it was nothing. Make no question about it, there was an enormous rush of panic across the investor base at this time. And the funny thing is, we hadn't even gotten started yet. Earlier today, the Federal Open Market Committee announced a one half percentage point reduction in the target range for the federal funds rate, bringing that range to one to one and a quarter percent. <clears throat> My colleagues and I took this action to help the U.S. economy keep strong in the face of new risks to the economic outlook. I want you to take a look at this guy. He's very important to our story. For anyone unfamiliar, this man's name is Jerome Powell. No cap, you can make the case he was the most important person in the world in 2020. Actually, scratch that. Let's also add most powerful to that. Now, I know what you guys are already thinking. How can this Mr. Feeney looking ass dude have that much influence over our day to day lives? Well, the simple answer to that is when he has full authority to decide monetary policy during the threat of the next Great Depression. For my beginner investors, it's a good time to point out two types of policy that can greatly impact the stock market fiscal policy and monetary policy. When you hear fiscal policy, think Congress, think government budget, think spending. When you hear monetary policy, think interest rates, think money supply, think the Federal Reserve. And Jerome Powell happens to be the head of the Federal Reserve, or Fed for short. So getting back to the timeline, on Tuesday, March 3rd, with markets spooked about the pandemic moving from a regional crisis to a global one, Jerome Powell and the Federal Reserve announced they were making an emergency cut to the federal funds rate by 50 basis points, or 0.5%, bringing it to a target rate of 1 to 1.25%. Cutting interest rates in this situation is done often to help stimulate economic growth and encourage spending by making borrowing cheaper. In basic terms, it's meant to reassure everyone, hey folks, no need to panic, just a minor speed bump, keep up the spending and business investment. In fact, here are some free comps, like if Powell was a manager at a casino or something. Also in his comments, Mr. Powell reiterated that the economy remained strong, but they wanted to help support the new risks posed by the virus. And despite some critics that argue the Fed acted too quickly. What we're saying is, this is to make people feel better. Okay, fine. So then do it the right way. Don't just drop it out at 10 a.m. when no one's paying attention. The markets actually ended up having a positive week following the decision, with the Dow Jones in particular up 1.8%. But that was going to change in a matter of days. Because what if I were to tell you throughout all of this COVID panic, there was another crisis knocking on the door at the same time? The norm here is to have everybody on board, unanimity. Sir, sir does that mean you have a rollover for 2.1 though? Do you, do, it soon? do you believe that you can bring unanimity soon and do a deal I, soon? I am a born optimist. I believe that nobody in this group of countries would like us to relapse into the last downturn. While the public was coming to grips with the pandemic impacting their lives on a day-to-day -day basis, it had already been greatly impacting the wallets of the largest oil producers in the world. You see, when news hit that China's economy was going to be materially impacted from the pandemic, the demand for oil globally was also undoubtedly going to be suppressed. And sure enough, in February 2020, the International Energy Agency announced they forecasted consumption for oil to decrease year over year for the first time since the financial crisis. With Brent crude oil falling dramatically, OPEC and OPEC Plus met on March 5th to discuss cutting oil production to help offset the lack of demand. The problem was, however, the two biggest players could not come to an agreement. And now is the perfect time to introduce two more characters to our story. First, we have the golden boy of the Middle East, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, Muhammad bin Salman. And the other corner, we have Mr. Vladimir Putin, who I do not believe needs any introduction. Despite the crown prince having an eerily similar rise to that of Joffrey Baratheon, minus the whole incest situation, MBS is a sharp guy who is supremely focused on advancing the wealth and prosperity of his country. At this meeting, Saudi Arabia demanded to its members that 1.5 million barrels a day of oil production be cut among every 
everyone to stabilize the price of oil. But Putin and Russia weren't buying it and refused to agree to any more cuts than what had already been agreed upon. Perhaps as a result of feeling they had shouldered the load of oil cuts too many times in the past, MBS and Saudi Arabia gave an ultimatum to Russia. Either you agree to this now or we will walk away and make sure you regret your decision. As if they were in a high game stakes of poker, Putin essentially said, your ultimatum, we will do what we want, and decline to move forward with the cuts. So what can only be described as pressing the nuclear button for mutual self-destruction, Saudi Arabia carried out their threat just in time for markets to open up Monday morning. Crude oil plunging 24% yesterday in a single day. It was the worst single day since the Gulf War started, coming in the wake of Saudi Arabia's split with Russia. On March 8th, the price of oil radically dropped nearly 30% after Saudi Arabia announced they were not only going to ramp up oil production, but they were also going to sell their oil at a massive discount at $6 to $8 a barrel. Holy cow. I want you guys to understand, this was happening at the same time we were bracing for the reckoning of the pandemic. A price of $6 to $8 a barrel for oil is like if Mercedes-Benz dropped one of their 100 k price cars to 15 to 20 k Imagine what that would do to its competitors and realize that's exactly what Saudi Arabia decided to do. The oil discussions went from dangerously tenuous to downright disastrous in a matter of days. All previous projections for oil companies like Exxon and Chevron, and even smaller companies, might as well have been used as toilet paper as their businesses were fundamentally changed forever. And combined with so much uncertainty already in the air, there was only one way the stock market could react. We just witnessed today. <laughs> that was brutal. Uh, obviously brutal. I mean, the markets rushed toward a place to say we have to start handicapping the probabilities of, uh, of a recession in this country. Just like that, Monday, March 9th brought us the single biggest day drop in the market in over a decade. No matter what people say about the stock market crash in 2020 being about COVID, it cannot be argued Saudi Arabia's ballsy move triggered the first of several March crashes that made us question how bad this was going to get. And remember, if you guys noticed in that last clip, people are still on the trading floor at this point. Within less than a week, that was all going to change. I'm Scott Van Pelt here at ESPN. This, this astounding and unprecedented story continues to evolve. Uh, at halftime with Adrian Wojnarowski, I suggested that uh, we would speak to him soon. I had no idea that it would be this soon. He has just tweeted within the past two minutes that the NBA is suspending the season. So whether you're a fan of sports or not, I firmly believe the decision on March 11th by the NBA to suspend their season after Jazz center Rudy Gobert tested positive for coronavirus radically changed the mindset of most people on how serious this pandemic was and served as one of the several domino effects for the transition to our new way of life. Personally, I remember exactly where I was when I heard the news and knew the next morning was going to be hell in the markets. Only a few hours earlier, President Trump abruptly announced a 30-day ban on the European Union without having notified European leaders. It's a bit funny in hindsight, but I can only imagine their surprise waking up in the morning to the news as Trump had made the announcement while Europe was still in the middle of the night. Anyways, just like I had thought, March 12, 2020 was another historic bloodbath in the stock market. The Dow Jones dropped 10% and was the single worst day since 1987. That is, of course, until we fast forward three days later to Black Monday. Remember our good friend Jerome Powell at the Federal Reserve? Well, he decided that he had seen enough to bring the U.S. back to zero interest rate environment for the first time since 2008 and announced this emergency rate cut alongside an unheard of $700 billion a month quantitative easing program. I have a link in the description of a great video that goes in detail about QE, but for the sake of time here... Look, up in the sky, it's a bird! It's a is it a blank check? Ironically, while the Fed was trying its best to help the situation, this unintentionally brought us the magnum opus of the three major single-day stock market crashes in 2020. On Wall Street, the worst day since 1987. The Dow losing almost 3,000 points even after the Fed cut interest rates to near zero. All in all, this final major crash saw the Dow drop 2,997 points or 12.9% 
which will hopefully remain the single biggest point drop in one day for many years to come. With the fortune of looking back at the past, on March 23rd a week later, the stock market hit the bottom and slowly started its descent back upward. In total, the top to bottom decline dropped around 34% in just over a month, making it the fastest drop ever recorded. This includes any point in the Great Depression, World War II, Vietnam, anything. But somehow, even as unemployment went to nearly 15% in April, the retail sector, travel sector, energy sector, all looking completely destroyed. The markets never panicked again in the same manner that they did in the month of March, which I personally think considering all the factors that were going on, was the craziest month that we may ever see in our lifetime. So the stock market. Right now we're sitting at 3,900, almost at 4,000, all time highs. You the viewer who might have just watched this video might be thinking, Kobe, how in the hell is the stock market at all time highs given the video that you just showed us? Well, my answer to that, I have no idea. I'm just some dope on YouTube. I have no idea. I don't know if this guy's gonna come up tomorrow. Hell, who knows? We might be done. No, I'm just kidding. But I do wanna talk about reasons as to why the stock market might have risen. From beginner investors that are watching this, I put together five reasons as to why the stock market may be up. Very brief, but just to tie off this video, here are some five reasons as to why the stock market may be up. Future Kobe, take it away. I'm gonna finish this drink. Number one, swift action by Congress and the Federal Reserve to inject liquidity into the markets. To me, and again, this is just my opinion, this is by far the most important reason as to why the stock market is where it's at today and did not crash further. Don't get me wrong, Congress was a disgrace on their handling of Stimulus Part 2, but the quick turnaround with Stimulus 1 via the CARES Act ensured unemployed workers and businesses would get immediate assistance from the government as a result of the pandemic. In addition, the Fed wasn't kidding around when they said they were going to ensure credit would be available in the public markets. They went as far as to controversially buy corporate ETFs and even started buying corporate bonds to provide confidence to lenders that the Fed would provide a backstop. Protecting credit also meant the indirect protection of companies who needed to raise billions of dollars of debt to survive. Once capital was available, bankruptcies that easily could have happened were avoided and stockholders came out as major winners. Number two, low interest rate environment may be leading to higher valuations. So this is another easy theory to accept that makes sense. With interest rates so low, US government bonds and corporate bonds just don't offer the same return as stocks, so equities just remain the better option. Number three, earnings have been better than what we thought. There was definitely a low bar for earnings in 2020, but a lot of companies actually were able to surpass the projections Wall Street put on them. To be fair, the market could also just be looking into the future and not as worried about present day earnings as they are in the coming years. Number four, the vaccine is here. We always expected a vaccine, but it wasn't a guarantee, and it sure wasn't a guarantee to have it by November 2020. It might have been forgotten by a few people, but this brought back cyclical stocks like financials, energy, and even retail from the dead, like you wouldn't believe. Growth stocks are still winning by a huge margin, but the value stocks rebound in late 2020 was quietly monumental for the market to reach this current level. Finally, number five, retail investors are now market movers. So obviously, there's no question retail investors have leveled up in comparison to institutional investors in 2020, and obviously judging from the situation with GME and other meme stocks, we don't mind bearing a ton of risk. Right now, there's a lot of money to be made playing in the stock market, and people are all here for it. Anyways guys, those are five reasons as to why the stock market may be going up, but remember, I'm not a financial advisor, you guys gotta do your own research, but I I do hope that this video at least helped inspire you guys to get more excited about stock market investing because nobody knows if the market's going to go up, it's going to go down. And if there's a crash, that means there's going to be a ton of opportunity for you guys to get in and make some money. With that said, I hope you guys have a beautiful day or night, whatever time it is. It's your boy Kobe P. I'll catch you on the next one. Peace.